I'm a game designer um, and that I make games in the real world, this is usually what they, they start thinking of. <laughs> um, and and this, is, this is kind of the, this is the common misconception about, uh, about games. Um, the, basically the proliferation of games on screen um, and computer games and the way that, that games uh, have, have uh, the way the lexicon of games has changed over the last few years has made us think that games need to be on a screen. But they don't. Um, I'm, a, I'm a kinetic game designer, which means that I, I don't design these kinds of games. I don't, I'm not anti-technology. Um, in fact, I, like, I really like working with technology. But I don't think that technology should be the start of when, anything that you're making, really. I don't think you should make anything simply because you found a cool piece of technology that you can exploit. I think that um, you, you, you owe it to the people that you're making things for to think about the uh, implications of what you're making and the applications of what you're making before you decide what kind of technology you're going to use for it. Um, so there's a, there's a common thinking about games that games help people escape from reality. And there's a, there's a designer that's pushing this idea named Jane McGonigal. If you guys watch TED Talks, which I'm sure you do, um, just look at you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's, a, there's a great talk by Jane McGonigal about, um, well, about her book, Reality is Broken. It's a very interesting book to read. She talks about why, uh, I mean, the subtitle is Why Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World. And, and her thesis is that games do these four things better than reality. Uh, doing satisfying work, being good at something, spending time with people we like, and being part of something bigger. And she uses World of Warcraft as a good example as to how by leveraging these four things, people in World of Warcraft accomplish incredibly huge tasks that require teamwork and that require coordination, et cetera. And that's all very interesting. And she's made several games that uh, try to leverage this to get people to solve global problems. Um, there's also been some examples of people making games like Fold It, um, which is a really interesting game about folding proteins that's actually helped develop some uh, new dr uh, treatments for, I think, for cancer. Um, so it's great, like the, the idea that you can use a game to leverage people's uh, talent across the world to solve a, a singular problem and a global problem, it's a very interesting idea. Um, it doesn't interest me that much, unfortunately. Uh, or, well, I mean, fortunately for me, I guess. But um, the reason I don't think this is very interesting is because it's focused on a virtual world. Um, and the use of games and the creation of a virtual space that people can uh, communicate across is, is not what I'm interested in. This is what I'm interested in. Um, and I'm interested specifically in this, right? In, in, <laughs> uh, in, in making games and making other kinds of experiences that are human scale. Um, the problem with, with the, the global scale and, and also the problem with the virtual scale is that um, it's not human-centric. It's not a human-sized thing. It's an enormous problem that uh, you can use technology, you can leverage that sort of thing to solve, but I, I'm not as interested in it as I am in what's going on in my neighborhood or what's going on in my city. Um, cities and neighborhoods are, are human-sized things that I think we can use games, and, and more broadly, we can use play to enhance and to improve. Um, so there's two, two concepts that I, I want to talk about with you uh, that I think games and play do really well. The one is social grease, and the other is spatial glue. As far as I know, I made these terms up. But um, social grease is uh, social grease is the capacity of games and play to allow people to interact with each other a little bit more freely. Um, I think I'm being live tweeted at. Actually, is the the beeping sound that's coming over there? By the way, <laughs> so um, no, it's great. <laughs> I love, I, I love the idea of being live tweeted at. Actually, I was, I was thinking, like, could I have it running up here and could I be answering questions live, like game style, <laughs> as we did. But um, we won't worry about that for now. Please continue live tweeting me. <laughs> 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 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute this so you can tweet in anonymity. <laughs> So where was I? Social grease, spatial glue, right. So um, let's start with spatial or social grease. Um, games are like booze. Um, games allow people to interact with each other in ways that are a little bit more free, a little bit more socially uh, unusual or uncommon or unexpected. Um, and the reason for this is that games create shared expectations between the players. Um, they also give players agency to do things that would otherwise terrify them. Um, we, we played a game up here earlier. We played two games up here, actually. Um, one involving uh, glow sticks dangling from your elbows, um, and another involving hand tapping. And both of those games, uh, <laughs> both of those games make people touch each other and make people get very close to each other in, in ways that are generally not socially acceptable. Um, the, the idea that you would be so close to a stranger that you may touch them or that you may brush up against them is very uncommon in this society. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an unusual thing about games that once we say, no, we're playing a game, this is a safe space, this is allowed, you have authority to touch other people. Uh, the, the ability to have those kind of interactions uh, increases greatly among people. Um, the other thing about, about the social grease is that games create their own language for people to communicate with. And I've played games where I didn't even speak the common language with the people I was playing with, but because we had the game in common, we had this shared vernacular that we could use to communicate with each other. We could communicate through the game. And this is true not only of people that we don't share a language with, but of people that we do share a language with. Uh, games break down a, a barrier between individuals because once we play a game with somebody else, we have that thing in common. And now we can go from this thing that we had in common, this experience that we shared, to start talking about other experiences that we can have or that we have had in our past and our futures. Um, and because of that, I think that games really allow people to engage with each other in, um, in ways that, that can be very profound. Uh, I, run, I run game events regularly. All, all these pictures are from, uh, most of these pictures are from game events that I've, I've run, uh, games that I've created, et cetera. And one of the, the interesting things about these events is that people come in as strangers and they leave as friends. And, and that's because this, this game experience allows people to have that kind of interaction with each other. Um, you can make an argument that this kind of social interaction is possible through online games, but I, I don't think it's nearly as profound. I think that um, having a, an experience with other people in a physical way, in, in a physical space, in the same physical space, is really important for um, having an experience that is impactful, but also long-lasting. And this actually leads to the other quality that I wanted to talk about, which is this idea of spatial glue. Um, Games and interactions are unique because they, they, they are in a place. They're imbued in, in or they, rather, they imbue a place with meaning. Um, if, you, if, you take a, if you take a, pl a group of players and you, and you give them a task to do in a space, you give them a game to play in a space, um, that creates a very powerful resonance with that space. Um, I, I do lots of, th these are uh, called pervasive games. I do a lot of uh, pervasive games. I do a lot of games in urban spaces because I think that playing in those urban spaces gives players authority to reimagine that space as something new. Um, I love it when this happens. Um, I love allowing people to have that agency to transform the place around them, even if it's just in their minds to start. And I'll talk about why I think this is so, but to give you an example, uh, I. I played a game called Field Crumpets on uh, the University of Pittsburgh lawn. And Field Crumpets is a game with big fat plastic bats and uh, like soft rubber balls. And you hit the ball with the bat and the ball goes all sorts of different directions. Um, and I was running after one and there was a, a lamp post. And, uh, and I thought, I'm gonna do this. And I ran and I jumped and I grabbed the lamp post and I swung around like, uh, like an action hero and I hit the ball back into the field of play in like one smooth motion. And every time I walk by that lamppost, I remember that moment. So now, now I have this like very personal and very strong connection to this place, to this, this stupid lamppost, right? This lamppost that is otherwise I would have walked by every single day in my life and never had any association with it. If somebody tries to tear that lamppost down, it's gonna affect me, right? <laughs> And you laugh, but this is, this is really important. And this is really an important way for people to 
um, have this sense of ownership over the places that they live, the places that they um, experience, the places that they go through every day. Um, and I think that the more you do this, the more, uh, the more it creates a feeling of community around the place, and around the, the things in that place. I love games uh, and I love playing in urban spaces because it associates the players with that space. And I think that the more you do that, the more agency you give people over these spaces and the more agency that you give them um, to reimagine them as whatever they want. I mean, that bush in this game is no longer a bush. It's a place to hide. That, you know, that brick wall is the place where that ball bounced off of that one time. These, now, these objects now, instead of being part of the background, have meaning. And by creating meaning, we create value in, in these places. And when we create value, we create, uh, we create this opportunity for people to be invested in the places that they live and work and, and play. Um, what's really going on here, I think, is the, is the nature of games and play. And, and I've been using games and play interchangeably. Um, games, are, I think, is a limiting word. Uh, so you can play and not play a game. Um, and I think it's actually really important to think about designing play in as much as we think about designing games. Uh, a couple years ago, the, the trend of gamification got started. And I really reject the idea of gamification because I think it's way too simplistic and way too limiting and way too, uh, way too on the surface, way too much on the surface. Um, instead, the, the company that I, I started and, and the, um, this organization that I run is focused on the idea of playification. Uh, the idea that we can use the aesthetics of games and, and the aesthetics of play and the mechanics of games, that is, to make real world things more fun. So I'm going to use games and play interchangeably, but, but just to get a sense of what I mean, that, that's, that's where my thinking is on, on the idea of, of play. Um, so play and, and games, games uh, do, do this thing where they, they create a temporary third space for the people involved. Um, see some people nodding their heads. Third space is an idea, or third place, third space is an idea in urban design. Um, it's a really interesting concept. It's actually one that we're, we're working on a project with the Sprout Fund now about. Um, but a third space, your, your home is your first place and your work is your second place. And good communities have third places. And a third place is a place where you can go and not be at home, but feel at home. So the bar on Cheers is a really good example of a third place that's fictional, right? Uh, great coffee shop, and you probably have one in your neighborhood, uh, is a place where you can go and have an experience of being welcomed, uh, meeting new people, welcoming them, being around other members of your community uh, in this place that is not your work or your home, in this third place. Playing, by creating this shared experience between the players, um, creates a temporary third place that is shared among those players in that space. And the more that you do that, I think the more that you can enhance your community through play. So this is the project we're working on now. Um, and it's, it's been tragically delayed uh, just because of the, the, the amount of other things that have, have had to happen. But uh, this is a project called We Are Here. It was a, a recipient of a, a Connector City grant from Sprout and uh, the Social Innovation Exchange. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify third places around the, uh, around the city. Um, this is Frick Park Market in, um, yeah, some people are nodding their heads. You know how cool Frick Park Market is. Um, so these are, th these are third places that we're starting to identify. We're asking, asking for submissions. Uh, if you have any ideas about third places in your neighborhood, please send them to us. And we'd like to go and look at them and take photographs. Um, but the, the, the extension of the idea is now not only to just take this idea, and we could create a, an online map of third places as one example. but I, I want to bring this experience of a third place to people on the, on the street level and have it be part of their everyday experience of the city. So we're creating these wayfinding signs that direct you from wherever you are to the nearest third place. And it's our hope that we can put these in places where you're in this neighborhood and now you learn of a third place in that neighborhood. And by going there, you have an introduction to this neighborhood and to the people that really make it their community. Um, in a way that facilitates you learning more about that community that you've just entered. I think this is a great opportunity for uh, the city to give tourists and visitors an actual authentic experience of the city. But I also think it's really important for residents and people who are normally here to go between neighborhoods and have not just a, a temporary or transient experience, but an actual deep experience of that community, that community that is not their own at this point. 
I don't really think that, I, I think that the, you know, the, the people don't travel between different neighborhoods thing about Pittsburgh, and, and I, I think that's a little overblown, but I do think that anything we can do to make people more comfortable in places that are not their home is an important thing for building up an overall community in the city and places beyond. This is the first City of Play project that City of Play is undertaking. And uh, to give you some background, City of Play started with, uh, with this kind of activity uh, in 2009. In 2009, uh, we, we received a, a seed award from the Sprout Fund, and we used it to plan our first festival of games. Uh, we also used it to run a series of outdoor game events that led up to the festival and some game events that went, uh, that, that went on afterwards. And we focused, at that time, City of Play was called Obscure Games. And Obscure Games is still, still exists. It is our, is our uh, outdoor game series that we run uh, in the summer and fall. Um, and we, we were focused on this idea of getting grown-ups outside to run around without having to tell them to go on a run. Uh, I, I, I enjoy exercising. I enjoy, enjoy moving around. But I don't like going on a run because somebody told me I had to. Um, and I don't like going to the gym because I feel like I'm getting fat. Um, what, I, what I do like is I like going outside and I like running around with a frisbee or a foxtail or a ball and throwing it to my friends and then going and having a beer afterwards because I think that that's a great kind of communal experience. And I got, you know, when I started this, I was, uh, I was not in very good shape and I got in much better shape just by going outside and running around for this, you know, this once a week experience and making play a part of my daily life. Um, and and even, even approaching my life with kind of a playful attitude or a playful idea. So we started with this idea of let's get outside and run around. Uh, we then went from there to let's go inside when it's cold and play games with each other at a bar. Um, and that was, that was what City of Play was for a couple of years. And now, uh, last year we, we changed the name to City of Play. We've uh, rebranded our festivals a little bit because the idea behind City of Play is evolving. And I'm very excited to share this with you because it's an, a very exciting time for me to be working as a designer around these ideas. Um, like I've been explaining, I think that games are a very powerful tool, play is a very powerful tool that we can use to reshape our community. And that's what the focus of City of Play is going to be for the next few years. Um, I mentioned that We Are Here is, is the first City of Play project. And at our last festival, uh, which was in August downtown, uh, we allowed other, we, we basically put out an invitation, a challenge to our participants there to create new ideas for other ways that people can engage playfully with their city. We had fantastic ideas come through, and, and uh, within, within three hours, people designed, prototyped, and implemented some of these different ideas. Uh, there was a, a chalk outline of dance steps on a crosswalk, um, or rather on, on the edge of a, a corner. So while you were waiting to cross the street, you could practice your dance steps. And, awesome. and yeah, it is awesome. Wait for it. Here it comes. Not only did the, the, this group uh, who was designing this make them on one side, they put mirroring steps on the other side. So two people could come up and accidentally start dancing with each other across, <laughs> across this, uh, this thing. So you guys know what I, what I just said about having that communal experience of play, having that, that experience of play in a space and sharing this experience with another person. Can you imagine the impact of accidentally dancing with a stranger um, in, in the middle of your city somewhere? It's not just about brightening your day, OK? It changes your perception of this whole city as a place to live and a place to feel alive. Um, so over the next few, few years, I want to build more and more of these things. I want to enhance the way that we experience our everyday uh, city life by creating opportunities for people to play accidentally or intentionally as, as they see fit. And it's called these environments of play. And I think that the more we can create environments of play, the, the better the city is going to be. Um, I also believe that we can use play to highlight urban and social issues. This is a game that we made. In, the game is actually up here um, at that little, that little uh, poster there. This is a game we made for the Gaji Festival in 2010, I think. Um, <clears throat> it's a game called, it's a game based on a, a game from London called uh, Visible Cities. This is Visible Cities Special Delivery. The idea here is that you're traveling, you're, you're a, a postal carrier traveling through different universes. And in each different universe, you have to travel through several of them in order to deliver your package. What we did was we took this idea of multiple universes and we mapped it onto vacant spaces on Penn Avenue. And there were a, a variety of abandoned storefronts uh, on Penn Avenue at the time. And we, we put 
we put new identities on these places uh, as, as, they, as though they were occupied in these alternate universes. The idea being to showcase these places not for what they were, which was abandoned and derelict, but for what they could be, which is, in this case, a vegan fur shop. Um, or a, an ice cream parlor, or a, a variety of other um, things that enhance the community that just aren't there yet. And um, it's, it's, I, I believe that this game really helped people who, who played it see these places as what they could be, and not just kind of brush by them for, for what they were. Um, this is another example. This is not a, a game that I, I made, but this is a designer who's also working around these ideas. Her name is Candy Chang. Um, I'm pretty inspired by some of the work that she does. And she does a great job of giving people a voice in their community. This is a project called I Wish This Was. She gave, as you can see, she gave uh, name badges with I Wish This Was and a blank slate, uh, allowing people to relabel abandoned pieces of their city with what they wanted to see in that neighborhood. Uh, many of our projects focus on giving people a, a blank space to write in what they want and displaying that publicly. And I think it's a great way to get people started talking about some of these things. Um, and a great way to draw attention to abandoned places that may otherwise have been forgotten. Um, and, and really to draw attention to the community that's behind that space and, or, or around it. So I think that Pittsburgh has this opportunity to become a world leader in urban play. And it's not just because of me. It's, it's This city is, more than any other place I've ever been, a place that gives its citizens agency to change it. Um, and I, I think that's incredibly important. I think that this is a place where, uh, and all of you have probably experienced this to some extent, if you wanted to, you could make a change. You can, you can affect the direction that this entire city is going in because it's the world's biggest small town, right? And um, so I think we have this opportunity to use play as a tool to reshape our city. And, and I, I'm, I, I want to be part of it, and I want all of you to be part of it as well. Because um, th th for, for these reasons specifically, one, play is cheap. All right? Play is a really cheap way to change the way we conceive of our environments. This is a game called Buck Up that uh, my friend and I made for $100. Uh, and it was a game where we hid dollar bills in balloons around the city. We tweeted where they were, and we ended up having people following us, like stalking us on Twitter, like <laughs> sneaking up on us to try to, to try to get to these balloons to win a dollar um, as soon as possible. So this is, this is a, a game that spread throughout the entire city. It was impactful in all these different neighborhoods, and it cost 100 bucks, right? Play is accessible. This is a project in um, London called 99 Tiny Games, and it was built around the 2012 Olympics. And the reason it was built was because even though the Olympics were in London, not everybody in London was going to go get to see them, right? So London hired this, ga uh, this game design, or this uh, interactive design company called Hide and Seek to make uh, a game experience or an experience of games that could happen in every single neighborhood of London. There's 33 of them. Um, so we win. And uh, there, are, there were three games in each of these 33 neighborhoods. These games are printed on vinyl, they're, they're plastered on the sidewalk, and they require nothing else except what's around you to play them. So by engaging with these games, everybody in the city had the opportunity to have an experience of the Olympic Games in the sense that this was associated with it, even if they couldn't actually go see the Olympics themselves. <laughs> and lastly, games are impactful. Um, this is one of my favorite games that I've ever made. It's a game called Curator, um, QR8R. I'm really proud of the title. Um, <laughs> and Curator is a game about art. And it's a game about understanding art, it's a game about buying art, and it's a game about being a critic of art. What I love about this game is it uses a pen and paper, um, and it sends people on a mission through a variety of places in, or to, to look at a variety of pieces of art in the museum. Each person is a curator of their own personal museum, uh, chosen at random by picking a Mad Lib style noun and verb. So it might be the Dog Museum of uh, Hairy Art, or the Starfish Museum of Incredible Art, or whatever, whatever their museum might be. Um, each of these players is playing with a different eye, a different lens, through which to see all the art in this museum. What's awesome about this is that you go through the museum, you spend your, your money, you buy as many pieces as you can, and then you come back and you talk to a critic to get bonus points. And in talking to this critic, you have to defend vehemently why this piece really deserves to be in the Starfish Museum of Incredible Art. And what this does is it gets people who don't think they have authority to talk about art talking about art. 
it gets people to have an opinion about a piece of art they may have walked by another time, at any, any other point. It gets people to talk with authority on um, on these things that they may not feel they're credited, they're, they're, they're credible in. And by doing that, it changes the way that these, they experience this art, and I think it enhances their experience tremendously. This game costs $20 to make. This is, a, this is a, a, an amount of time, you know, the, the amount of time in conceptualizing, and, and everything is, is, is irrelevant because this costs 20 bucks, right? It costs 20 bucks to give people a brand new experience of their museum that is different every single time they come back. Um, so we're, we're a city that's really famous for its sports, right? We're famous for our love of sports, uh, this guy especially. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, and I mean, the, the, the fever around the, the Pirates getting to the postseason this year, I mean, was incredible. Um, so my, my feeling is what we've done up to this point is we've, we've pushed the idea of play and the, the idea of games and sports onto the professionals, and we, we've, we worship them uh, for it. And what I want to see is us take, take some of that back, bring some of that back into the world of everyday people and everyday experience of, of the city. Um, so this is, this is my next project. Um, and this is, this is the next City of Play project that I want to work on. This is an example of a, a vacant lot, uh, I think, in Larimer. Um, what I want to do is I want to transform some of the vacant places in Pittsburgh into grown-up playgrounds. And I want to create places where people can go and be together, play a game, play cornhole, play ping pong, whatever they want, hang out uh, in a place that's not a bar, in a place that doesn't cost any money, in a place that is, uh, for all intents and purposes, a third space. And I want to create them in places that were previously overlooked and previously vacant. Um, I think that by building these, and I think you can build them cheaply, uh, I think you can run this whole program cheaply, um, and I think that you can run it in a way that is impactful to the people, not only of the neighborhood, but people who are coming through. Um, it's my feeling that if, if, if we do this, we can highlight some places that people already are that are being overlooked. And it's my hope that you can use play in this way to start a revitalization process in different neighborhoods. So by showing where people want to congregate or are willing to congregate, um, and showing that to people who can transform these neighborhoods through actual infrastructure, um, I think that that's a great way to start, uh, start a trend in, in various neighborhoods around the city of revitalization. Um, and then if, if, you know, if our vacant lot gets built over and a, and a new place that the community wants is, is put in, that's fine, because we just move it to the next place, right? We just move this, this experience of play around the city uh, to different places. And one of the exciting things, I'm a, I'm a member of Tech Shop now, um, which was a, a little present I gave myself. And I, I did it because I think that there's a tremendous opportunity to be around creative people in this space as well as other places in the city. And it, it provides the tools that, that I want to use to build this. Um, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a thing that I can do by myself because I don't know how. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of opening this up to anybody that's here, um, anybody that's interested in these ideas to become a collaborator and become not, a, not just a collaborator but a creator of these, of these different kinds of spaces and experiences. Um, that's, so that's, that's the vision for, uh, for next year, and, and I want to get this started over the winter, and I want to see what we can do to work with the city uh, to make these places happen um, and create a, a more pervasive experience of play for all the people in Pittsburgh. Uh, in the meantime, I want to talk about this. <laughs> um, so this is fantastic, right? This, this is like the fact that we have a giant duck sitting out front of <laughs> Who does that? So I, I think that this is really representative of the value of uh, the value of playfulness, you know, and, and approaching your city through a, uh, through a playful lens. Um, everybody loves the duck. Right? <laughs> everybody loves it, and it's and, and the most profound thing about the duck is that it's a rubber duck. Like it's a it's a giant rubber duck. You go down and see it, and like, yep, that's a giant rubber duck. That's <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't pretend to be anything that it's not. It doesn't have any other higher significance. It's just for fun. Like, it's just fun. Um, and, and I think that this is fantastic because it's, it's a great way to experience your city. It's a great lens to see your city through in that this is something that we, we support. This is something that we're into. Beyond that, if you want to talk to me, if you want to email me, if you want to live tweet at me, um, everything is at cityofplay.org. So we are on Twitter at City of Play. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash cityofplay. And this is my email address. I, uh, I'm also starting, a, I, well, I've been running a company for the last couple of uh, years. And um, next week, we have a big demonstration. So I won't get back to you right away.
but I promise I read all the emails I get and I will respond to it as soon as I can. Uh, and I love to hear what you have to say. So thanks very much. <laughs>